Welcome to this month's webcast from the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare. Um, these webcasts are part of the Learning Network and this month we decided to do something slightly different. My name is Nessa Barry, some of you will know me from the Learning Network and I'm here with Jim Ferguson. Um, again, some of you will know Ferg from the telehealth community and the clinical community in Scotland. Ferg, do you want to give your job title? Yes, uh, my name is Professor James Ferguson. I'm the National Clinical Lead for the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare and in my remaining time I'm an active emergency medicine consultant in Aberdeen. So this month what we decided to do, and luckily Ferg was up for it, is to try and go back to basics a little bit. And what we're going to do is go through um, an introduction to telehealth and telecare. So when I talk to groups of students, and Ferg, you're probably the same, mm -hmm. I tend to take the starting point of what do you think telehealth and telecare is? And often I'm met with quite a lot of blank faces and maybe a dozen people who have got really strong opinions about how technology is being used. We'll start with telehealth. Now, the definition we tend to use is that it's nice and simple, the provision of health services at a distance using a range of digital and mobile technologies. What do you think, Ferg? Does that cover it? I think that's quite good. The, 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 the only thing I've, would like, I've always thought of this as is that when we say that at a distance, people think it's a big distance. Mm. And actually, it's about accessing healthcare. So you, if you are in a prison, you might not be able to get to a hospital very quickly, even though it's just outside the building. Yeah. So, um, so even it's not necessarily about distance. It's about you know you can be in situations where maybe for waiting waiting list times or things like that, you're not going to get access to, to care. And the thing is, it's using technology to redesign service delivery to allow you to access healthcare. Moving on to telecare. Um, telecare is generally seen as the provision of care services at a distance, again, keeping that caveat in mind, using a range of different types of technologies. Now, in Scotland, a lot of the telecare services that we see, and I'll get more into this in part two of the webcast, um, which will focus on social care, they derive from community alarm services across the local authorities in Scotland and have become more sophisticated and developed newer and different ways of using technology as time has gone on. So really, telecare focuses particularly on the use of technologies, alarms, environmental sensors, alerts um, in people's homes or in a community setting. This slide shows the range of kind of context for definitions. A lot of our colleagues, especially in social care and the voluntary sector, will talk about assistive technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get mixed up with this. Don't, don't let it stop you from understanding the context and the actual use. Um, it's not worth that. It's just another term that's yeah. being used for more or less the same definition of technologies. I don't know if you want to come in on telemedicine. No, I think that I think that's right. And I think in some ways the terms allow us to define what we're doing to a certain extent, but often they hold us back. And I, I, from my point of view, the, the fact that we say about care, care is everything. I mean, and we forget that it's health care. It's in the same word. So um, I tend to think of it now more as delivering care in its widest sense using technology or communic particular communications technology. And to a certain extent, the differentiation between telehealth and telecare is really just trying to define the environments in which it's being applied. Whereas what we have to start thinking of, technology is all around us. We don't have a department of telephone medicine so why do we have to have telecare just because we're using more advanced things? Mm. It's actually just about using the tools that are around us to deliver care, but also what, it, what it absolutely is key is changing the method in which we deliver care. Because mm. this isn't about a new treatment or a new drug or anything. This is about delivering existing high-quality medical interventions and care interventions and some simple care interventions, but in a new transformative way. Mm. So with all of these definitions you know circulating in the back of your head what's it really for? What's yeah. it all about? And, and Ferg's pointed out these things already. It's to make it easier for people to access services wherever they are, city, rural, it doesn't matter, and to allow health and social care professionals to participate um, and increasingly I would say voluntary sector and, yeah. others, and sometimes supplier organisations um, to allow them to plan, to share to deliver care in a slightly different way but it's the care that counts hopefully by the end of that part of the presentation 
you can have a better understanding of what we mean about these terms when we use them um, and where they fit into that landscape of terminology. So the drivers are fairly obvious. They're the same ones that apply to health and social care across the board internationally. It doesn't matter where you are. These are the challenges that push us forward. I think sustainability and resilience is, is different. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. I, th I, think th I think the one thing I would say if you want to think of this in a different way is that what we tend to do is we tend to say, oh my word, we've got a silver tsunami, people are living longer, yeah. and that's the big problem, or it's, you know, we're, we're struggling to have enough health carers. It, it's, it's even bigger than that. What you've got to think of is this is a different world from who I was 30 years ago. So I qualified as a medical student in 1983, 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago. The, at that time, we had a healthcare system that was designed to deal with acute illnesses in people who were in middle age or early el elderly. Um, now, and you know, and a, and a range, but a very limited range of treatments. I mean, in those days, there wasn't any treatment for a heart attack. It was just mm. starting thrombolytics. were just starting to come out. So, what's different now, and it's not the health services' fault, is that we've moved on, and now the elderly population large numbers of patients are older and are over 80 and actually the type of medicine for these people is not delivered in acute hospitals a few of them need that most of them need their care delivered in the community that's a, that's a result of our success and mm. how we deal with disease now at the same time it's not just the elderly we now have much more interventions for younger people or people presenting with disease and actually we have to do more for patients who are relatively fit, and then even for the fit, people who are well, there are more interventions mm -hmm. to support them. The problem is we're still trying to deliver this in a healthcare setting that still is based in a post-1940s, early 60s uh, way of delivery. And as these numbers increase, using the old system isn't probably effective for the people it's being used for and is not sustainable because it's highly intensive. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's not about thinking about individual things. It's about the fact that actually what we need to do is say, new world, I can walk around with a phone in my pocket with all the knowledge in the world can be delivered to me directly. We are not good at assessing and evaluating changes to service delivery. Mm. And you know, if, if there was one message to every, anyone who's watching this would be, look at how you manage patients at the moment and try and step back and think, why am I still doing it this way? Is that appropriate? Is it an efficient process? Because when we go in most places and ask them that, it's suddenly they go, but we've always done it this way. And then you go, but isn't that a bit mm. inefficient? And actually stepping back and saying, oh, well, maybe it is, often makes it helps people to open their minds as to what could be, and it could be, will be better for patients. That's a fair point. So how we deliver technology, I just wanted to give one example about how we use technology rather and how how it's changing so we work with nhs 24 um, and as well as nhs 24 providing uh, telephone based services across scotland nhs 24 provides a really diverse range of web-based services now that a lot of people are not very familiar with unless they've had a reason to use them so i just wanted to pick out one which is nhs inform and you'll see the link and you can go and check it up and find more information um, and this is really just an information point. And NHS Inform actually delivers a whole range of services under its heading. So it delivers um, a service called Common Health Questions, it delivers a support directory, and it delivers a Health A to Z, which is very, very popular, people looking up information. They have questions about their own health or the health of a family member or because they may themselves be a carer or work in the voluntary sector. So there's an appetite. There is a shift in the way members of the public, which includes you and me, yeah. are willing to use technology themselves to gain information. David Heaney up at Inverness is part of the Centre for Rural Health and has been doing quite a lot of research on the topic of e-health yeah. and new services and service development for a number of years. And they've been part of something called the Northern Periphery Project up there. Um, and one of the things they've been looking at is the way new e-health, telehealth technology services can be developed and delivered. And there's a short video, and the link is here, which you can look at. And, and the reason I've chosen this one is they talk about teledialysis, they talk about speech and language therapy, but what's interesting about it is the way the staff talk about equity. 
and providing that access for their service users, their patients, wherever they happen to be. From our point of view, in SCTT has been primarily was looking at healthcare applications uh, and laterally really pushing into the telecare because what you have to realise is it's not about individual areas, it's about changing the whole way we live basically. It is about lifestyles, that's why that now is the sort of main driver. Whereas it started off with particular medical conditions, which mm. you would understand because these are high health priorities, it seems to have grown out from that. So stroke, funnily enough, well not funnily enough, stroke is mainly affects elderly people with more elderly people so that became one of our real drivers because mm. we had a new treatment from the evidence-based medicine mm. what we didn't have was a really good way of delivering that mm. you had to get to a ct scanner people were driving and you might not make it in time so or to a center that could make the decision and the person who give you the decision was in the hospital and the, and the patient may be in a hospital at least had a ct scanner but not somebody who would make decision making and of course once you start redesigning the system so that actually you've divided the delivery of care from the person who's making the decision from where the assessment is made suddenly you find that not only are you getting some benefits to the patients there's knock on mm -hmm. um, positive effects from that as well that you never anticipated to start with so having started this off so the patient would go to get the uh, CT scan link in with a doctor who then would give advice and the patient would be treated earlier according to current guidelines, the next thing we found was actually if you are getting a stroke clinician who's making that decision all the time rather than a doctor following a protocol, the outcomes are better. So suddenly it's not a case of I get to hospital and there's a doctor there following the guideline. We mm. know that if you can get access to someone who really knows how to do this, they will actually push the envelope a wee bit and we get better outcomes. And of course the other thing is the people locally get better at delivering the mm. care. So instead of just teaching them in a classroom, this is what you do, actually they're learning on the job and we're able to evolve the care. So now stroke guidelines for treatment have expanded. We know we can safely treat more patients. So by embedding the new service delivery, we're actually pushing the agenda for what is the best treatment. Not in the way of is it you know, a better drug or a worse drug, but actually the drug that we've got can actually be used in a on a wider range of patients with better health outcomes. So it's not just about saying we're delivering the same health care benefit but in a different way. It's actually we're able to extend and improve outcomes beyond that. No one anticipated that mm -hmm. in advance. Stroke has shown that and actually in almost every other area of acute health care, which is what I'm involved in, sepsis. Rather a great example, if you can assess the patient in the home, elderly patient with sepsis or young patient with sepsis, child with meningitis, and actually do a few tests there and take advice, we're now finding that early treatment, allowing the, the GP or the um, paramedic or even a healthcare responder to be able to deliver antibiotics and develop in systems for that, we're finding mortalities decreasing. And it's all these things that we thought Oh, it's just a different way of delivering it. It's not actually speeding this up, getting good decision making early. It's having significant results in mortality and morbidity. So it's it's it really is the argument now for not applying this is almost mm. redundant. There's almost ethical need for people to start thinking, I need to include this in my practice. That's a very good point actually, Ferg. I think that um Again, when it, when we move on to talk about things like the National Delivery Plan, which you can access, download and have a look at yourself, I'm just going to flag up the, the work streams for the delivery plan and the associated business plan for telehealth and telecare in Scotland 2015. When we talk about improving health and social care, we talk about integration, we talk about well-being and empowering people. But I think this point about actually empowering people for me is tied yeah. up with improving sustainability Absolutely. and resilience um, and also the health and social care integration element. If you say you're taking the decision making to where the person who needs it is, whether that's a patient or a service user, whatever terminology we use, yeah. that you actually start to shift and make that transformation. Absolutely. But, but the quality element I think is what's really interesting. The argument, which is very hard <laughs> to go up against, that you can actually use these tools to help you um, deliver as good as outcomes or better outcomes for that service user and that's only to the benefit of yep. everybody involved isn't it um, that that's what we ultimately want is to make services that are better for people yep. and wherever we happen to be living at the time is the service for 
just as a point of information um, for anyone watching, that the services in A&E in Aberdeen then and to the community hospitals, are they still inactive? Because they were a very early part yeah, of the Yeah, they're, they're still active. Stuff. I mean, it's part of our routine care that um, we deliver and is that. that something that would happen on a weekly basis? Or well, it's, it's a, they'll be knocking through the patients this morning in the department. We're still reducing transfers by about 85%. But uh, I think the, the, the key point to this is that, that we, we work within our own region. And this has been the problem with healthcare, and, and, and just care in general, is that it's, it's all in silos. So, um, what you got up until now, it's you, you, you travel to get care, you travel to get health care. You may get some health care at home, but someone will travel to you <laughs> to deliver mm -hmm. the care. So, it's all about people moving. And yes, people will still have to move, but the point is can we make this much more efficient and safe? Because we know a lot of the travel that occurs is wrongly thought to be, well, that would require this for safety. So uh, you are better to go to hospital because it's safe. Well, it's not. If you overcrowd a hospital, mortality goes up. And particularly if you don't actually need the services of the hospital, your risk of ac actually having an adverse outcome increases up to about 20% in some cases. Equally the same for healthcare workers uh, in, in the community. If your care is being delivered, your monitoring involves you going to the doctor to get your blood pressure done all the time, that's using up resource, you're travelling. Why not? just collect the data at home and somebody monitor you and then come and see you when there's a problem. Mm. Same for just care routinely. Why can't somebody be um, uh, Facebooking or Skyping in to check on people? Because if it is just a routine check, don't go to the house. Okay. <laughs> so it, it's, it really is about trying to think differently and that's all about integrating services. Now that's difficult. Mm. That's really difficult. Integrating services and then uh, also providing services across traditional territorial boundaries becomes very difficult mm. and usually the obstructions are administrative historical practices that when we get to them when we come up against them they go you can't do this because we've got this system that was to protect this area and you're like well you know what guys you really need to think about this because this isn't about care the data is there the evidence is there we can't be stopped by bureaucracy and, and we do live in an existing bureaucracy that often challenges our ability to integrate. And if we integrate, we will get much better healthcare outcomes and better lifestyles. But I wanted to point out the Carers Scotland website. If you go to Carers Scotland website and you click under um, learning more about telehealth care, I think it's the heading, but it's on the Scotland page, you can't miss it really. Care Scotland, um, with some support from SCTT in the last few years, have developed a number of short films which are from the perspective of carers and people who are being cared for. Uh, and I would strongly recommend them as a, as a good learning resource that you can use. I've put this slide in um, as, I, as I'm always trying to reinforce to people, you know, if you don't have the confidence and the competence and the knowledge base in the staff, you can talk about these wonderful service designs and redesigns all day long and they probably won't happen. At least they won't happen the way you want them to. Some time ago, we did a piece of work ourselves around the competencies for staff. And one of the things um, we looked at was teleconsultation and what do people need to know if they're in that environment. And I think whenever you're using technology, whether you're using an electronic health record, whether you're using a tablet to access information at the bedside, yeah. um, whether you're using it in home care, and whether you're using teleconsultation or video conferencing by another name, these things all apply. Your job is to be the patient's advocate. Absolutely. Your job is to maintain confidentiality in that environment and privacy and dignity for the person in that environment. And your job is to explain to the patient, the participant, who's there and why. Today we're going to speak to you, Professor Ferguson about XYZ. Can you tell us who else is in the room? We're here, I am, this is, and to explain the situation as it goes along. If if you're not um, in an area where teleconsultation is included in the protocols for yeah. seeing patients, that may be something that you can actually pick up on the ball on yourself. Because I think that's a very important aspect of embedding this into routine practice. Yeah, no, that's absolutely cool. I end your, I'll address your last comment first. Is The problem is we see over and over again, people saying, we have a problem here, let's redesign the service, and then they come up with all sorts of 
convoluted ways of improving how we deliver service. And then we come in and say, have you even contemplated using telehealth or remote diagnosis and support? And, and they're like, because they just keep trying to solve it in the old method. Now, a major part of this is because... Stuff. Some people will hear you saying about teleconsultation and you have to do this and you have to be trained in it. Um, um, and the reason people are nervous with this is we're not very good at introducing this in undergraduate teaching so that we tend to always say you will be face to face with the patient. And the thing is, we do so many other things in our lives now where we don't, we're not, I didn't buy my ticket from, the, from a man this morning, I bought it online, you know, I get my insurance, how many people have actually insurance salesmen come to the house anymore? We've accepted it for all these other environments because there's a positive to it, but we seem to be in care and, and healthcare, and is, is that it's this, this absolutely having to be in front of the patient. So we're uncomfortable with this. However, my experience and most people's experience is that actually when you introduce telehealth, the quality improves. The reason is we develop bad habits. So often people will walk into a room and not introduce themselves to a patient who's in front of them because they're busy getting on with things. Whereas the etiquette of using a remote consultation because the patient is physically remote, you don't make the assumption you've seen and read my name badge. Somebody says, yes, this is going to be... Uh, Nessa Barry, who is fine, who she is, why she's there. And in fact, my experience has been that actually the quality of consultation improves because you, ha you adopt an etiquette that we don't use mm -hmm. elsewhere in the system. So, and actually it can be even better than face-to-face -face consultation as well. Sometimes I've got to say because it's not hurried, you've not had to wait several hours before you come in. You're going to get slack for saying that. Yeah, I know. Well, the, other, the other big thing is, and there was a point you made here, was most people don't remember a lot of their consultations with someone. Most, I think, of my opinion, I've already did, most of the patients I consult on remember and understand better. Two reasons. I tend to be much more formal about where I speak to them, so that's me, I'm a great guy. But that's not it. If they're scared to ask me a question, when I drop the call, the person at the far end, if it's a nurse or somebody they trust locally, will then explain to them and ask them what they've done, and will encourage them to ask questions to make sure, and often prompt them. So some people would say, well, that mean, involves two people in the consultation, but the reality is we're saving in lots of other ways with patients not traveling, and, and often their retention is better because they are in an environment where they feel secure, either their own home in the case of telecare or telemonitoring, so they're relaxed, get better results, physiological results, or if having to go and access healthcare via the GP or in a secondary care, suddenly, because they're in a relaxed environment, they actually get more out of the consultation. And it, people don't think about that. They think, oh, but if you manage to get into the hospital and see somebody and you're actually face-to-face, -face, there's, a, there's a benefit. No one has ever quantified for me the benefit of actually sitting in the same room with somebody as opposed to using telehealth. In fact, most people prefer it. Well, on that challenging point, uh, you'll see on the slide we have links to um, both etiquette kind of guidelines, a checklist. If you want to really learn more about this or if you're in a situation as a practitioner, as a health or social care staff, where you're going to be using teleconferencing, video conferencing, remote consultation, whatever you call it, if you're going to be doing this and you want to learn more about how to do it well. Hopefully, the information presented has helped you to understand some of the key policy highlights, uh, the service drivers, but also that really interesting kind of social change yeah. dimension and the expectation around the way we as individuals in society use technology now and how that will be increasingly shaping the way people access information about health and care. Um, the use of technology is only going to increase, I think, I don't think it's a startling statement. Um, and your role within that, or your understanding of that, it will be important to how you continue to practice, how you continue to work in whichever field you do. There are lots of additional resources that you'll find links to in the presentation, as I said, and downloads. I would strongly encourage you to have a look at them. Farag, do you want to say anything to finish? Yeah, I think the final thing is, you know, people don't like change, particularly in a socialised um, uh, national environment. but. You know what? Go try it. Most people who try it will see the positive benefits for the patients and often for them themselves as well. It may involve you changing your practice a little, maybe doing a little bit more one thing or less of another, but have an open mind to it. Don't just say, no, this is different. Try it. 
because it is the future and it will improve the lot of our patients, of ourselves and of the organisation. It's a win-win-win-win-win-win situation if we can get this embedded on, uh, on a large scale. And I just want to finally say thanks very much to Ferg for taking the time Thank you very much. Uh, to come down from Aberdeen and to take time out of his day to do this session with us today. I think it's really important that you get the perspective of somebody who understands it as a national and a strategic perspective, but also is doing it every yep. day. Um, so thanks very much, Ferg, for coming. And I hope this has been useful for you.